This is your Unit 3 review on periodicity. First thing you need to know is the difference between families and series. To help you remember this, I've made up a mnemonic device. Uh, for Grandma, could Rosie please sing? So for Grandma, the F and the G stands for family slash groups, and the C stands for columns. Rosie please stands for rows and periods, and sing stands for series. So the columns are going to be the families slash groups. And if you look on your table of elements, it even says there group. So you should know that that is going to be the families, and those are always the columns. Next is the rows, which are the periods and series. So the things going across, those are periods, sometimes called series. So to help you remember, for Grandma, could Rosie please sing? You should also know the difference between metals, nonmetals, and metalloids. Metals are going to be shiny, lustrous, excellent conductors, and they can be shaped with a hammer. The word for that is malleable. So down here you have a picture of some silver. And you see that the silver is shiny, uh, it's lustrous. If you were to put a conductivity meter up to this, it would conduct electricity very well. And if you hit it with a hammer, you would find that it wouldn't break. It would simply bend. Next is nonmetals. Those are dull. They're poor conductors, and they shatter when hit with a hammer. The word for that is brittle. So here you have some sulfur. That's a nonmetal. Uh, it's sort of chalky, uh, yellow, kind of smelly. We saw this in class, and we were able to smash some of it with a hammer. So anytime that you hit something with a hammer and it breaks, chances are pretty good it's going to be a nonmetal. Last one is going to be a metalloid, and that's going to be something that's got the properties of both, or it's somewhere in between. So an example of this would be boron, which you see pictured here. It does have some of the properties of metals, but as you can see, it's also kind of dull as well. So that would be an example of a metalloid. Best way to tell if something is a metalloid, however, is to look at the periodic table of elements. Pretty much all of the elements that touch that bold staircase, those are the ones that are going to be metalloids. There are a couple exceptions, but as a general trend, if they're touching the staircase, it's going to be a metalloid. You should also know the position of these various groups on the table of elements, so alkali metals, transition elements, halogens, and noble gases. So alkali metals is going to be group 1, except hydrogen. These are all alkali metals, lithium, sodium, potassium. All of these guys share similar properties. They're explosive whenever they hit water, uh, highly reactive. They all have one valence electron, so they very easily form uh, salts with the group 17 nonmetals. The transition elements are going to be the ones that are in the middle, um, but whenever you think of transition metals, there's also a couple of... Uh, Inclusions here, uh, tin and lead, are also going to be transition metals. But generally, things from 3 through 12. And again, there's an insert here. So these guys here actually belong in that group as well. And they're sort of in there as an insert. So those are also included. Next up is the halogens. That's group 17. So fluorine, chlorine, bromine, these are all the halogens. And the last column is noble gases. So the noble gases are so called because they tend to be very unreactive. All of these guys have full octets. So they have no desire to react with any other elements in order to get their full octet. So those are the main groups on the periodic table of elements that you need to know. Again, use this table wisely. If you look, you're given a lot of information on here. You're told in the key, in case you get confused, it tells you the symbol, the atomic mass, the name, the atomic number. Um, so you can get a lot of information there. You also have the group labeled up here, so you should know that the groups are going to be the columns. Um, you have Roman numerals. If you look at just the Roman numeral part, you can, for most of these, you can figure out um, how many valence electrons. So that's one, two, uh, three, four, five, six, and seven, and eight. 
Now, these guys in the middle here, while they do have Roman numerals as well, um, those guys are all going to be the transition elements. So there's not really any good shortcut to figure out how many electrons just by looking at this. That's why whenever we go to name these compounds, it's a little more complicated and we have to use Roman numerals. Okay, so trends. Here are three of the big ones. First one is ionization energy, and that's going to be how much energy I need to make an ion by pulling off an electron. So ionization energy, the energy needed to make an ion. So ionization, energy needed to make an ion. Next one is electronegativity. This is a measurement of how strongly an atom attracts electrons. So, for example, it's kind of like a measure of how attractive the atom itself is to electrons. Things that are more electronegative are going to attract more electrons, whereas things that are less electronegative are going to attract less electrons. So that's electron negativity. Okay, keywords there in red. Next one is atomic radius. Now in math, the, the radius is going to be from the edge of the circle to the center of the circle. In chemistry, the atomic radius is from the center of the atom to the outer edge of the electron cloud. So that's it right here. So it's essentially a measure of the size of the atom. So here are the trends sort of graphically illustrated. There's your table of elements. First trend is going to be ionization energy. And this increases as you go up and as you go towards the right. So that means that the element with the highest ionization energy is going to be fluorine here. So fluorine's got highest ionization energy. Next is electronegativity. Again, as you go up and to the right, that increases. So fluorine, once again, has the highest uh, electronegativity as well as ionization energy. So basically, the closer something is to fluorine, the higher the ionization and electronegativity are going to be. Lastly is the atomic radius. The atomic radius shows the opposite trend. So the element with the largest atomic radius is actually going to be francium down here. So the closer something is to francium, the higher the uh, the larger the atomic radius is going to be. So that covers the basics of unit 3. Here are some key ideas to remember. First, trends are overall. They may not describe every single element correctly, but overall they are correct. You should know them. They're just sort of a general trend that the elements show, their properties show. Next, one thing I advise for you to do is to draw arrows slash label your table of elements to help you keep the trends straight. So sometimes whenever you're reading a question it can be confusing it could be asking you about left and right and up and down and sometimes it's just easier to graphically show these things so we don't get confused next you should remember for grandma could Rosie please sing if you don't know what I'm talking about slide back a few slides and take a look use your table well Again, there's a lot of information already there. That's why it's so useful to chemists, because all the stuff that we need to know is printed right on there. You should know what that ladder means and how to use the key in case you forget which numbers are which.